Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure by John Cleland Letter the First Part One Madam, I sit down to give you an undeniable proof of my considering your desires as indispensable orders. Ungracious, then, as a task may be, I shall recall to view those scandalous stages of my life, out of which I emerged at length, to the enjoyment of every blessing in the power of love, health, and fortune to bestow. Whilst yet in the flower of youth, and not too late to employ the leisure afforded me, by great ease and affluence, to cultivate an understanding, naturally not a despicable one, and which had, even amidst the whirl of loose pleasures I had been tossed in, exerted more observation on the characters and manners of the world than what is common to those of my unhappy profession, who, looking on all thought or reflection as their capital enemy, keep it at as great a distance as they can, or destroy it without mercy. Hating, as I mortally do, all long unnecessary preface, I shall give you good quarter in this, and use no farther apology, than to prepare you for seeing the loose part of my life, wrote with the same liberty that I led it. Truth, stark, naked truth, is the word, and I will not so much as take the pains to bestow the strip of a gauze wrapper on it, but paint situations such as they actually rose to me in nature, careless of violating those laws of decency that were never made for such unreserved intimacies as ours. And you have too much sense, too much knowledge of the originals, to sniff prudishly and out of character at the pictures of them. The greatest men, those of the first and most leading taste, will not scruple adorning their private closets with nudities, though, in compliance with vulgar prejudices, they may not think them decent decorations of the staircase or salon. This, and enough premised, I go south into my personal history. My maiden name was Frances Hill. I was born at a small village near Liverpool in Lancashire, of parents extremely poor, and, I piously believe, extremely honest. My father, who had received a maim on his limbs that disabled him from following the more laborious branches of country drudgery, got, by making of nets, a scanty subsistence, which was not much enlarged by my mother's keeping a little day-school for the girls in her neighbourhood. They had had several children, but none lived to any age except myself, who had received from nature a constitution perfectly healthy. My education, till past fourteen, was no better than very vulgar, reading, or rather spelling, an illegible scrawl, and a little ordinary plain work composed the whole system of it, and then all my foundation in virtue was no other than a total ignorance of vice, and the shy timidity general to our sex, in the tender stage of life when objects alarm or frighten more by their novelty than anything else but then this is a fear too often cured at the expense of innocence when miss by degrees begins no longer to look on a man as a creature of prey that will eat her my poor mother had divided her time so entirely between her scholars and her little domestic cares that she had spared very little to my instruction having from her own innocence from all ill no hint or thought of guarding me against any i was now entering on my fifteenth year when the worst of ills befell me in the loss of my fond tender parents who were both carried off by the smallpox within a few days of each other my father dying first and thereby hastening the death of my mother so that i was now left an unhappy friendless orphan for my father's coming to settle there was accidental he being originally a kentishman that cruel distemper which had proved so fatal to them had indeed seized me but with such mild and favourable symptoms that i was presently out of danger and what i then did not know the value of was entirely unmarked i skip over here an account of the natural grief and affliction which I felt on this melancholy occasion. A little time, and the giddiness of that age dissipated too soon, my reflections on that irreparable loss. 
but nothing contributed more to reconcile me to it than the notions that were immediately put into my head of going to london and looking out for a service in which i was promised all assistance and advice from one esther davis a young woman that had been down to see her friends and who after the stay of a few days was to return to her place as i had now nobody left alive in the village who had concern enough about what should become of me to start any objections to this scheme and the woman who took care of me after my parents death rather encouraged me to pursue it i soon came to a resolution of making this launch into the wide world by repairing to london in order to seek my fortune a phrase which by the by has ruined more adventurers of both sexes from the country than ever it made or advanced nor did esther davis a little comfort and inspirit me to venture with her by piquing my childish curiosity with the fine sights that were to be seen in london the tombs the lions the king the royal family the fine plays and operas and in short all the diversions which fell within her sphere of life to come at the detail of all which perfectly turned the little head of me nor can i remember without laughing the innocent admiration not without a spice of envy with which we poor girls whose church-going clothes did not rise above dowless shifts and stuff gowns beheld esther's scoured satin gowns caps bordered with an inch of lace tawdry ribbons and shoes belaced with silver all which we imagined grew in london and entered for a great deal into my determination of trying to come in for my share of them the idea however of having the company of a townswoman with her was the trivial and all the motives that engaged esther to take charge of me during my journey to town where she told me after her manner and style as how several maids out of the country had made themselves and all their kin for ever that by preserving their virtue some had taken so with their masters that they had married them and kept them coaches and lived vastly grand and happy and some mayhap came to be duchesses luck was all and why not i as well as another with other almanacs to this purpose which set me a tiptoe to begin this promising journey and to leave a place which though my native one contained no relations that i had reason to regret and was grown insupportable to me from the change of the tenderest usage into a cold air of charity with which i was entertained even at the only friend's house that i had the least expectation of care and protection from she was however so just to me as to manage the turning into money of the little matters that remained to me after the debts and burial charges were allowed for and at my departure put my whole fortune into my hands which consisted of a very slender wardrobe packed up in a very portable box and eight guineas with seventeen shillings in silver stowed up in a spring pouch which was a greater treasure than ever i had yet seen together and which i could not conceive there was a possibility of running out and indeed i was so entirely taken up with the joy of seeing myself mistress of such an immense sum that i gave very little attention to a world of good advice which was given me with it places then being taken for esther and me in the chester wagon i pass over a very immaterial scene of leave-taking at which i dropped a few tears betwixt grief and joy and for the same reasons of insignificance skip over all that happened to me on the road such as the wagoners looking liquorish on me the schemes laid for me by some of the passengers which were defeated by the vigilance of my guardian esther who to do her justice took a motherly care of me at the same time that she taxed me for her protection by making me bear all the travelling charges which i defrayed with the utmost cheerfulness and thought myself much obliged to her into the bargain she took indeed great care that we were not overrated or imposed on as well as of managing as frugally as possible expensiveness was not her vice it was pretty late in a summer evening when we reached the town in our slow conveyance 
though drawn by six at length as we passed through the greatest streets that led to our inn the noise of the coaches the hurry the crowds of foot passengers in short the new scenery of the shops and houses at once pleased and amazed me but guess at my mortification and surprise when we came to the inn and our things were landed and delivered to us when my fellow-traveller and protectress esther davis who had used me with the utmost tenderness during the journey and prepared me by no preceding signs for the stunning blow i was to receive when i say my only dependence and friend in this strange place all of a sudden assumed a strange and cool air towards me as if she dreaded my becoming a burden to her instead then of proffering me the continuance of her assistance and good offices which i relied upon and never more wanted she thought herself it seems abundantly acquitted of her engagements to me by having brought me safe to my journey's end and seeing nothing in her procedure towards me but what was natural and in order began to embrace me by way of taking leave whilst i was so confounded so struck that i had not spirit or sense enough so much as to mention my hopes or expectations from her experience and knowledge of the place she had brought me to whilst i stood thus stupid and mute which she doubtless attributed to nothing more than a concern at parting this idea procured me perhaps a slight alleviation of it in the following harangue that now we were got safe to london and that she was obliged to go to her place she advised me by all means to get into one as soon as possible that i need not fear getting one there were more places than parish churches that she advised me to go to an intelligence office that if she heard of anything stirring she would find me out and let me know that in the meantime i should take a private lodging and acquaint her where to send to me that she wished me good luck and hoped i should always have the grace to keep myself honest and not bring a disgrace on my parentage with this she took her leave of me and left me as it were on my own hands full as lightly as i had been put into hers left thus alone absolutely destitute and friendless i began then to feel most bitterly the severity of this separation the scene of which had passed in little room in the inn and no sooner was her back turned but the affliction i felt at my helpless strange circumstances burst out into a flood of tears which infinitely relieved the oppression of my heart though i still remained stupefied and most perfectly perplexed how to dispose of myself one of the drawers coming in added yet more to my uncertainty by asking me in a short way if i called for anything to which i replied innocently no but i wished him to tell me where i might get a lodging for that night he said he would go and speak to his mistress who accordingly came and told me dryly without entering in the least into the distress she saw me in that i might have a bed for a shilling and that as she supposed i had some friends in town here i fetched a deep sigh in vain i might provide for myself in the morning tis incredible what trifling consolations the human mind will seize in its greatest afflictions the assurance of nothing more than a bed to lie on that night calmed my agonies and being ashamed to acquaint the mistress of the inn that i had no friends to apply to in town i proposed to myself to proceed the very next morning to an intelligence office to which i was furnished with written directions on the back of a ballad of esther's giving me there i counted on getting information of any place that such a country girl as i might be fit for and where i could get into any sort of being before my little stock should be consumed and as to a character esther had often repeated to me that i might depend on her managing me one nor however affected i was at her leaving me thus did i entirely cease to rely on her as i began to think good-naturedly that her procedure was all in course and that it was only my ignorance of life that had made me take it in the light i at first did accordingly the next morning i dressed myself as clean and as neat as my rustic wardrobe would permit me and having left my box with special recommendation with the landlady i ventured out by myself 
and without any more difficulty than can be supposed of a young country girl barely fifteen and to whom every sign or shop was a gazing trap i got to the wished-for intelligence office it was kept by an elderly woman who sat at the receipt of custom with a book before her in great form and order and several scrolls made out of directions for places i made up then to this important personage without lifting up my eyes or observing any of the people round me who were attending there on the same errand as myself and dropping her curtsies nine deep just made a shift to stammer out my business to her madam heard me out with all the gravity and brow of a petty minister of state and seeing at one glance over my figure what i was made me no answer but to ask me the preliminary shilling on receipt of which she told me places for women were exceedingly scarce especially as i seemed too slight built for hard work but that she would look over her book and see what was to be done for me desiring me to stay a little till she had dispatched some other customers on this i drew back a little most heartily mortified at the declaration which carried with it a killing uncertainty that my circumstances could not well endure presently assuming more courage and seeking some diversion from my uneasy thoughts i ventured to lift up my head a little and sent my eyes on a course round the room wherein they met full tilt with those of a lady for such my extreme innocence pronounced her sitting in a corner of the room dressed in a velvet mantle in the midst of summer with her bonnet off squab fat red-faced and at least fifty she looked as if she would devour me with her eyes staring at me from head to foot without the least regard to the confusion and blushes her eyeing me so fixedly put me to and which were to her no doubt the strongest recommendation and marks of my being fit for her purpose after a little time in which my air person and whole figure had undergone a strict examination which i had on my part tried to render favourable to me by priming drawing up my neck and setting my best looks she advanced and spoke to me with the greatest demureness q sweetheart do you want a place a yes and please you with a curtsy down to the ground upon this she acquainted me that she was actually come to the office herself to look out for a servant that she believed i might do with a little of her instructions that she could take my very looks for sufficient character that london was a very wicked vile place that she hoped i would be tractable and keep out of bad company in short she said all to me that an old experienced practitioner in town could think of and which was much more than was necessary to take in an artless inexperienced country maid who was even afraid of becoming a wanderer about the streets and therefore gladly jumped at the first offer of a shelter especially from so grave and matron-like a lady for such my flattering fancy assured me this new mistress of mine was i being actually hired under the nose of the good woman that kept the office whose shrewd smiles and shrugs i could not help observing and innocently interpreted them as marks of her being pleased at my getting into place so soon but as i afterwards came to know these beldams understood one another very well and this was a market where mrs brown my mistress frequently attended on the watch for any fresh goods that might offer there for the use of her customers and her own profit madam was however so well pleased with her bargain that fearing i presume lest better advice or some accident might occasion my slipping through her fingers she would officiously take me in a coach to my inn where calling herself for my box it was i being present delivered without the least scruple or explanation as to where i was going this being over she bid the coachman drive to a shop in st paul's churchyard where she bought a pair of gloves which she gave me and thence renewed her directions to the coachman to drive to her house in street who accordingly landed us at her door after i had been cheered up and entertained by the way with the most plausible flams without one syllable from which i could conclude anything but that i was by the greatest good luck fallen into the hands of the kindest mistress not to say friend that the varsal world could afford 
and accordingly i entered her doors with most complete confidence and exultation promising myself that as soon as i should be a little settled i would acquaint esther davis with my rare good fortune you may be sure the good opinion of my place was not lessened by the appearance of a very handsome back parlour into which i was led and which seemed to me magnificently furnished who had never seen better rooms than the ordinary ones in inns upon the road there were two gilt pier glasses and a buffet on which a few pieces of plates set out to the most show dazzled and altogether persuaded me that i must be got into a very reputable family here my mistress first began her part with telling me that i must have good spirits and learn to be free with her that she had not taken me to be a common servant to do domestic drudgery but to be a kind of companion to her and that if i would be a good girl she would do more than twenty mothers for me to all which i answered only by the profoundest and awkwardest curtsies and a few monosyllables such as yes no to be sure presently my mistress touched the bell and in came a strapping maid-servant who had let us in here martha said mrs brown i have just hired this young woman to look after my linen so step up and show her her chamber and i charge you to use her with as much respect as you would myself for i have taken a prodigious liking to her and i do not know what i shall do for her martha who was an arch jade and being used to this decoy had her cue perfect made me a kind of half curtsy and asked me to walk up with her and accordingly showed me a neat room two pair of stairs backwards in which there was a handsome bed where martha told me i was to lie with a young gentlewoman a cousin of my mistress's who she was sure would be vastly good to me then she ran out into such affected encomiums on her good mistress her sweet mistress and how happy i was to light upon her that i could not have bespoke a better with other the like gross stuff such as would itself have started suspicions in any but such an unpractised simpleton who was perfectly new to life and who took every word she said in the very sense she laid out for me to take it but she readily saw what a penetration she had to deal with and measured me very rightly in her manner of whistling to me so as to make me pleased with my cage and blind to the wires in the midst of these false explanations of the nature of my future service we were rung for down again and i was reintroduced into the same parlour where there was a table laid with three covers and my mistress had now got with her one of her favourite girls a notable manager of her house and whose business it was to prepare and break such young fillies as i was to the mounting block and she was accordingly in that view allotted me for a bedfellow and to give her the more authority she had the title of cousin conferred on her by the venerable president of this college here i underwent a second survey which ended in the full approbation of mrs phoebe Ayres, the name of my tutoress elect to whose care and instructions i was affectionately recommended dinner was now set on table and in pursuance of treating me as a companion mrs brown with a tone to cut off all dispute soon overruled my most humble and most confused protestations against sitting down with her ladyship which my very short breeding just suggested to me could not be right or in the order of things at table the conversation was chiefly kept up by the two madams and carried on in double meaning expressions interrupted every now and then by a kind assurance to me all tending to confirm and fix my satisfaction with my present condition augment it they could not so very a novice was i then it was here agreed that i should keep myself up and out of sight for a few days till such clothes could be procured for me as were fit for the character i was to appear in of my mistress's companion observing withal that on the first impressions of my figure much might depend and as they rightly judged the prospect of exchanging my country clothes for london finery made the clause of confinement digest perfectly well with me but the truth was mrs brown did not care that i should be seen or talked to by any either of her customers or her does as they'd call the girls provided for them till she had secured a good market for my maidenhead 
which i had at least all the appearances of having brought into her ladyship's service to slip over minutes of no importance to the main of my story i pass the interval to bedtime in which i was more and more pleased with the views that opened to me of an easy service under these good people and after supper being showed up to bed miss phoebe who observed a kind of reluctance in me to strip and go to bed in my shift before her now the maid was withdrawn came up to me and beginning with unpinning my handkerchief and gown soon encouraged me to go on with undressing myself and still blushing at now seeing myself naked to my shift i hurried to get under the bedclothes out of sight phoebe laughed and was not long before she placed herself by my side she was about five-and-twenty by her most suspicious account in which according to all appearances she must have sunk at least ten good years allowance too being made for the havoc which a long course of hackney ship and hot waters must have made of her constitution and which had already brought on upon the spur that stale stage in which those of her profession are reduced to think of showing company instead of seeing it no sooner then was this precious substitute of my mistresses laid down but she who was never out of her way when any occasion of lewdness presented itself turned to me embraced and kissed me with great eagerness this was new this was odd but imputing it to nothing but pure kindness which for aught i knew it might be the london way to express in that manner i was determined not to be behindhand with her and returned her the kiss and embrace with all the fervour that perfect innocence knew encouraged by this her hands became extremely free and wandered over my whole body with touches squeezes pressures that rather warmed and surprised me with their novelty than they either shocked or alarmed me the flattering praises she intermingled with these invasions contributed also not a little to bribe my passiveness and knowing no ill i feared none especially from one who had prevented all doubt of her womanhood by conducting my hands to a pair of breasts that hung loosely down in a size and volume that full sufficiently distinguished her sex to me at least who had never made any other comparison i lay then all tame and passive as she could wish whilst her freedom raised no other emotions but those of a strange and till then unfelt pleasure every part of me was open and exposed to the licentious courses of her hands which like a lambent fire ran over my whole body and thawed all coldness as they went my breasts if it is not too bold a figure to call so two hard firm rising hillocks that just began to show themselves or signify anything to the touch employed and amused her hands a while till slipping down lower over a smooth track she could just feel the soft silky down that had but a few months before put forth and garnished the mount pleasant of those parts and promised to spread a grateful shelter over the sweet seat of the most exquisite sensation and which had been till that instant the seat of the most insensible innocence her fingers played and strove to twine in the young tendrils of that moss which nature has contrived at once for use and ornament but not contented with these outer posts she now attempts the main spot and began to twitch to insinuate and at length to force an introduction of a finger into the quick itself in such a manner that had she not proceeded by insensible gradations that inflamed me beyond the power of modesty to oppose its resistance to their progress i should have jumped out of bed and cried for help against such strange assaults instead of which her lascivious touches had lighted up a new fire that wantoned through all my veins but fixed with violence in that centre appointed them by nature where the first strange hands were now busied in feeling squeezing compressing the lips then opening them again with a finger between till an oh expressed her hurting me where the narrowness of the unbroken passage refused it entrance to any depth in the meantime the extension of my limbs languid stretchings sighs short heavings 
all conspired to assure that experienced wanton that i was more pleased than offended at her proceedings which she seasoned with repeated kisses and exclamations such as oh what a charming creature thou art what a happy man will he be that first makes a woman of you oh that i were a man for your sake with the like broken expressions interrupted by kisses as fierce and salacious as ever i received from the other sex for my part i was transported confused and out of myself feelings so new were too much for me my heated and alarmed senses were in a tumult that robbed me of all liberty of thought tears of pleasure gushed from my eyes and somewhat assuaged the fire that raged all over me phoebe herself the hackneyed thoroughbred phoebe to whom all modes and devices of pleasure were known and familiar found it seems in this exercise of her art to break young girls the gratification of one of those arbitrary tastes for which there is no accounting not that she hated men or did not even prefer them to her own sex but when she met with such occasions as this was a satiety of enjoyments in the common road perhaps too a secret bias inclined her to make the most of the pleasure wherever she could find it without distinction of sexes in this view now well assured that she had by her touches sufficiently inflamed me for her purpose she rolled down the bedclothes gently and i saw myself stretched naked my shift being turned up to my neck whilst i had no power or sense to oppose it even my glowing blushes expressed more desire than modesty whilst the candle left to be sure not undesignedly burning threw a full light on my whole body no says phoebe you must not my sweet girl think to hide all these treasures from me my sight must be feasted as well as my touch i must devour with my eyes this springing bosom suffer me to kiss it i have not seen it enough let me kiss it once more what firm smooth white flesh is here how delicately shaped then this delicious down oh let me view the small dear tender cleft this is too much i cannot bear it i must i must here she took my hand and in a transport carried it where you will easily guess but what a difference in the state of the same thing a spreading thicket of bushy curls marked the full-grown complete woman then the cavity to which she guided my hand easily received it and as soon as she felt it within her she moved herself to and fro with so rapid a friction that i presently withdrew it wet and clammy when instantly phoebe grew more composed after two or three sighs and heart-fetched o's and giving me a kiss that seemed to exhale her soul through her lips she replaced the bedclothes over us what pleasure she had found i will not say but this i know that the first sparks of kindling nature the first ideas of pollution were caught by me that night and that the acquaintance and communication with the bad of our sex is often as fatal to innocence as all the seductions of the other but to go on when phoebe was restored to that calm which i was far from the enjoyment of myself she artfully sounded me on all the points necessary to govern the designs of my virtuous mistress on me and by my answers drawn from pure undissembled nature she had no reason but to promise herself all imaginable success so far as it depended on my ignorance easiness and warmth of constitution after a sufficient length of dialogue my bedfellow left me to my rest and i fell asleep through pure weariness from the violent emotions i had been led into when nature which had been too warmly stirred and fermented to subside without allaying by some means or other relieved me by one of those luscious dreams the transports of which are scarce inferior to those of waking real action in the morning i awoke about ten perfectly gay and refreshed phoebe was up before me and asked me in the kindest manner how i did 
how i had rested and if i was ready for breakfast carefully at the same time avoiding to increase the confusion she saw i was in at looking her in the face by any hint of the night's bed scene i told her if she pleased i would get up and begin any work she would be pleased to set me about she smiled presently the maid brought in the tea equipage and i just huddled my clothes on when in waddled my mistress i expected no less than to be told off if not chid for my late rising when i was agreeably disappointed by her compliments on my pure and fresh looks i was a bud of beauty this was her style and how vastly all the fine men would admire me to all which my answers did not i can assure you wrong my breeding they were as simple and silly as they could wish and no doubt flattered them infinitely more than had they proved me enlightened by education and knowledge of the world we breakfasted and the tea-things were scarce removed when in were brought two bundles of linen and wearing apparel in short all the necessaries for rigging me out as they termed it completely imagine to yourself madam how my little coquette heart fluttered with joy at the sight of a white lute-string flowered with silver scoured indeed but passed on me for spick and span new a brussels lace cap braided shoes and the rest in proportion all second-hand finery and procured instantly for the occasion by the diligence and industry of the good mrs brown who had already a chapman for me in the house before whom my charms were to pass in review for he had not only in course insisted on a previous sight of the premises but also on immediate surrender to him in case of his agreeing for me concluding very wisely that such a place as i was in was of the hottest to trust the keeping of such a perishable commodity in as a maidenhead the care of dressing and tricking me out for the market was then left to phoebe who acquitted herself if not well at least perfectly to the satisfaction of everything but my impatience of seeing myself dressed when it was over and i viewed myself in the glass i was no doubt too natural too artless to hide my childish joy at the change a change in real truth for much the worse since i must have much better become the neat easy simplicity of my rustic dress than the awkward untoward tawdry finery that i could not conceal my strangeness to phoebe's compliments however in which her own share in dressing me was not forgot did not a little confirm me in the first notions i had ever entertained concerning my person which be it said without vanity was then tolerable to justify a taste for me and of which it may not be out of place here to sketch you an unflattered picture i was tall yet not too tall for my age which as i before remarked was barely turned to fifteen my shape perfectly straight thin-waisted and light and free without owing anything to stays my hair was a glossy auburn and as soft as silk flowing down my neck in natural buckles and did not a little set off the whiteness of a smooth skin my face was rather too ruddy though its features were delicate and the shape a roundish oval except where a pit on my chin had far from a disagreeable effect my eyes were as black as can be imagined and rather languishing than sparkling except on certain occasions when i have been told they struck fire fast enough my teeth which i ever carefully preserved were small even and white my bosom was finely raised and one might then discern rather the promise than the actual growth of the round firm breasts that in a little time made that promise good in short all the points of beauty that are most universally in request i had or at least my vanity forbade me to appeal from the decision of our sovereign judges the men who all that i ever knew at least gave it thus highly in my favour and i met with even in my own sex some that were above denying me that justice whilst other praised me yet more unsuspectedly by endeavouring to detract from me in points of person and figure that i obviously excelled in this is i own too much too strong of self-praise 
but should i not be ungrateful to nature and to a form to which i owe such singular blessings of pleasure and fortune were i to suppress through an affectation of modesty the mention of such valuable gifts well then dressed i was and little did it then enter into my head that all this gay attire was no more than decking the victim out for sacrifice whilst i innocently attributed all to mere friendship and kindness in the sweet good mrs brown who i was forgetting to mention had under pretence of keeping my money safe got from me without the least hesitation the driblet so i now call it which remained to me after the expenses of my journey after some little time most agreeably spent before the glass in scarce self-admiration since my new dress had by much the greatest share in it i was sent for down to the parlour where the old lady saluted me and wished me joy of my new clothes which she was not ashamed to say fitted me as if i had worn nothing but the finest all my lifetime but what was it she could not see me silly enough to swallow at the same time she presented me to another cousin of her own creation an elderly gentleman who got up at my entry into the room and on my dropping a curtsey to him saluted me and seemed a little affronted that i had only presented my cheek to him a mistake which if one he immediately corrected by gluing his lips to mine with an ardour which his figure had not at all disposed me to thank him for his figure i say than which nothing could be more shocking or detestable for ugly and disagreeable were terms too gentle to convey a just idea of it imagine to yourself a man rather past threescore short and ill-made with a yellow cadaverous hue great goggling eyes that stared as if he was strangled an outmouth from two more properly tusks than teeth livid lips and breath like a jake's then he had a peculiar ghastliness in his grin that made him perfectly frightful if not dangerous to woman with child yet made as he was thus in mock of a man he was so blind to his own staring deformities as to think himself born for pleasing and that no woman could see him with impunity in consequence of which idea he had lavished great sums on such wretches as could gain upon themselves to pretend love to his person whilst to those who had not art or patience to dissemble the horror it inspired he behaved even brutally impotence more than necessity made him seek in variety the provocative that was wanting to raise him to the pitch of enjoyment which too he often saw himself balked of by the failure of his powers and this always threw him into a fit of rage which he wreaked as far as he durst on the innocent objects of his fit of momentary desire this then was the monster to which my conscientious benefactress who had long been his purveyor in this way had doomed me and sent for me down purposely for his examination accordingly she made me stand up before him turned me round unpinned my handkerchief remarked to him the rise and fall the turn and whiteness of a bosom just beginning to fill then made me walk and took even a handle from the rusticity of my gait to inflame the inventory of my charms in short she omitted no point of jockeyship to which he only answered by gracious nods of approbation whilst he looked goats and monkeys at me for i sometimes stole a corner glance at him and encountering his fiery eager stare looked another way from pure horror and affright which he doubtless in character attributed to nothing more than maiden modesty or at least the affectation of it however i was soon dismissed and reconducted to my room by phoebe who stuck close to me by way of not leaving me alone and at leisure to make such reflections as might naturally rise to any one not an idiot on such a scene as i had just gone through but to my shame be it confessed such was my invincible stupidity or rather portentous innocence that i did not yet open my eyes to mrs brown's designs and saw nothing in this titular cousin of hers but a shocking hideous person which did not at all concern me 
unless that my gratitude for my benefactress made me extend my respect to all her cousinhood phoebe however began to sift the state and pulses of my heart towards this monster asking me how i should approve of such a fine gentleman for a husband fine gentleman i suppose she called him from his being daubed with lace i answered her very naturally that i had no thoughts of a husband but that if i was to choose one it should be among my own degree sure so much had my aversion to that wretched hideous figure indisposed me to all fine gentlemen and confounded my ideas as if those of that rank had been necessarily cast in the same mould that he was but phoebe was not to be beat off so but went on with her endeavours to melt and soften me for the purposes of my reception into that hospitable house and whilst she talked of the sex in general she had no reason to despair of a compliance which more than one reason showed her would be easily enough obtained of me but then she had too much experience not to discover that my particular fixed aversion to that frightful cousin would be a block not so readily to be removed as suited the consummation of their bargain and sale of me mother brown had in the meantime agreed the terms with this liquorish old goat which i afterwards understood were to be fifty guineas peremptory for the liberty of attempting me and a hundred more at the complete gratification of his desires in the triumph over my virginity and as for me i was to be left entirely at the discretion of his liking and generosity this unrighteous contract being thus settled he was so eager to be put in possession that he insisted on being introduced to drink tea with me that afternoon when we were to be left alone nor would he hearken to the procuress's remonstrances that i was not sufficiently prepared and ripened for such an attack that i was too green and untamed having been scarce twenty-four hours in the house it is the character of lust to be impatient and his vanity arming him against any supposition of other than the common resistance of a maid on those occasions made him reject all proposals of a delay and my dreadful trial was thus fixed unknown to me for that very evening at dinner mrs brown and phoebe did nothing but run riot in praises of this wonderful cousin and how happy that woman would be that he would favour with his addresses in short my two gossips exhausted all their rhetoric to persuade me to accept them that the gentleman was violently smitten with me at first sight that he would make my fortune if i would be a good girl and not stand in my own light that i should trust his honour that i should be made for ever and have a chariot to go abroad in with all such stuff as was fit to turn the head of such a silly ignorant girl as i then was but luckily here my aversion had taken already such deep root in me my heart was so strongly defended from him by my senses that wanting the art to mask my sentiments i gave them no hopes of their employer succeeding at least very easily with me the glass too marched pretty quick with a view i suppose to make a friend of the warmth of my constitution in the minutes of the imminent attack thus they kept me pretty long at table and about six in the evening after i was retired to my own apartment and the tea-board was set enters my venerable mistress followed close by that satyr who came in grinning in a way peculiar to him and by his odious presence confirmed me in all the sentiments of detestation which his first appearance had given birth to he sat down fronting me and all tea-time kept ogling me in a manner that gave me the utmost pain and confusion all the marks of which he still explained to be my bashfulness and not being used to see company tea over the commode old lady pleaded urgent business which was indeed true to go out and earnestly desired me to entertain her cousin kindly till she came back both for my own sake and hers and then with a pray sir be very good be very tender of the sweet child she went out of the room leaving me staring with my mouth open and unprepared by the suddenness of her departure to oppose it we were now alone and on that idea a sudden fit of trembling seized me i was so afraid without a precise notion of why and what i had to fear that i sat on the settee by the fireside motionless and petrified 
without life or spirit not knowing how to look or how to stir but long i was not suffered to remain in this state of stupefaction the monster squatted down by me on the settee and without further ceremony or preamble flings his arms about my neck and drawing me pretty forcibly towards him obliged me to receive in spite of my struggles to disengage from him his pestilential kisses which quite overcame me finding me then next to senseless and unresisting he tears off my neck handkerchief and laid all open there to his eyes and hands still i endured all without flinching till emboldened by my sufferance and silence for i had not the power to speak or cry out he attempted to lay me down on the settee and i felt his hand on the lower part of my naked thighs which were crossed and which he endeavoured to unlock oh then i was roused out of my passive endurance and springing from him with an activity he was not prepared for threw myself at his feet and begged him in the most moving tone not to be rude that he would not hurt me hurt you my dear says the brute i intend you no harm has not the old lady told you that i love you that i shall do handsomely by you she has indeed sir said i but i cannot love you indeed i cannot pray let me alone yes i will love you dearly if you let me alone and go away but i was talking to the wind for whether my tears my attitude or the disorder of my dress proved fresh incentives or whether he was not under the dominion of desires he could not bridle but snorting and foaming with lust and rage he renews his attack seizes me and again attempts to extend and fix me on the settee in which he succeeded so far as to lay me along and even to toss my petticoats over my head and lay my thighs bare which i obstinately kept close nor could he though he attempted with his knee to force them open effect it so as to stand fair for being master of the main avenue he was unbuttoned both waistcoat and breeches yet i only felt the weight of his body upon me whilst i lay struggling with indignation and dying with terror but he stopped all of a sudden and got off panting blowing cursing and rehearsing upon me old and ugly for so i had very naturally called him in the heat of my defence the brute had it seems as i afterwards understood brought on by his eagerness and struggle the ultimate period of his hot fit of lust which his power was too short-lived to carry him through the full execution of of which my thighs and linen received the effusion when it was over he bid me with a tone of displeasure get up saying that he would not do me the honour to think of me any more that the old bitch might look out for another cully that he would not be fooled so by error a country mock modesty in england that he supposed i had left my maidenhead with some hobnail in the country and was come to dispose of my skin-milk in town with a volley of the like abuse which i listened to with more pleasure than ever fond woman did to protestations of love from her darling minion for incapable as i was of receiving any addition to my perfect hatred and aversion to him i looked on this railing as my security against his renewing his most odious caresses yet plain as mrs brown's views were now come out i had not the heart or spirit to open my eyes to them still i could not part with my dependence on that beldam so much did i think myself hers soul and body or rather i sought to deceive myself with the continuation of my good opinion of her and chose to wait the worst at her hands sooner than being turned out to starve in the streets without a penny of money or a friend to apply to these fears were my folly whilst this confusion of ideas was passing in my head and i sat pensive by the fire with my eyes brimming with tears my neck still bare and my cap fallen off in the struggle so that my hair was in the disorder you may guess the villain's lust began i suppose to be again in flow at the sight of all that bloom of youth which presented itself to his view a bloom yet unenjoyed and in course not yet indifferent to him after some pause he asked me with a tone of voice mightily softened whether i would make it up with him before the old lady returned and all should be well he would restore me to his affections 
at the same time offering to kiss me and feel my breasts but now my extreme aversion my fears my indignation all acting upon me gave me a spirit not natural to me so that breaking loose from him i ran to the bell and rang it before he was aware with such violence and effect as brought up the maid to know what was the matter or whether the gentleman wanted anything and before he could proceed to greater extremities she bounced into the room and seeing me stretched on the floor my hair all dishevelled my nose gushing out blood which did not a little tragedize the scene and my odious persecutor still intent of pushing his brutal point unmoved by all my cries and distress she was herself confounded and did not know what to do as much however as martha might be prepared and hardened to transactions of this sort all womanhood must have been out of her heart could she have seen this unmoved besides that on the face of things she imagined that matters had gone greater lengths than they really had and that the courtesy of the house had been actually consummated on me and flung me into the condition i was in in this notion she instantly took my part and advised the gentleman to go down and leave me to recover myself and that all would be soon over with me that when mrs brown and phoebe who were gone out were returned they would take order for everything to his satisfaction that nothing would be lost by a little patience with the poor tender thing that for her part she was frightened she could not tell what to say to such doings but that she would stay by me till my mistress came home as the wench said all this in a resolute tone and the monster himself began to perceive that things would not mend by his staying he took his hat and went out of the room murmuring and pleating his brows like an old ape so that i was delivered from the horrors of his detestable presence as soon as he was gone martha very tenderly offered me her assistance in anything and would have got me some hartshorn drops and put me to bed which last i at first positively refused in the fear that the monster might return and take me at that disadvantage however with much persuasion and assurances that i should not be molested that night she prevailed on me to lie down and indeed i was so weakened by my struggles so dejected by my fearful apprehensions so terror-struck that i had not the power to sit up or hardly to give answers to the questions with which the curious martha plied and perplexed me such too and so cruel was my fate that i dreaded the sight of mrs brown as if i had been the criminal and she the person injured a mistake which you will not think so strange on distinguishing that neither virtue nor principles had the least share in the defence i had made but only the particular aversion i had conceived against the first brutal and frightful invader of my tender innocence i passed then the time till mrs brown came home under all the agitations of fear and despair that may easily be guessed end of section one